and we are rolling on May 31st, 2018, here at UCLA, where it's a beautiful day. Saw birds fly by. The sunshine is shining, as it usually does. We have a beautiful campus. Beautiful to walk between classes and see how beautifully this campus is landscaped. Isn't it, Danielle? Danielle Lederman, what a beautiful name. Uh -huh. And today we're going to debate climate change, formerly known as global warming <laughs> before the hiatus. And the topic today is the politicization of science is undesirable. I repeat, the politicization of science is undesirable. Debating for the affirmative, leading the affirmative charge will be Brett and Sidney Allen Wade. And in the opposition camp, Leading the opposition will be Pratik and Brittany. Each side will have a seven-minute constructive, a two-minute cross-examination, and a two-minute rebuttal, which will consist of four parts he said, I disagree because therefore. Brett stands before you managing attention, looking around to make sure all computers are closed, phones are away, all eyeballs are upon him. He's managing attention. He's communicating respect non-verbally. He says to himself, I respect my audience and really means it quiet call. <laughs> okay. Finds friendly eyes near the front and the center. Say your name. Feel the love. Start your speech. Good afternoon. I'm Brett Nagy. Hi Brett. Hello. Today myself and my partner Cindy will be providing evidence to show that politicizing science is undesirable. First, I'd like to define some of the words. Politicizing essentially means political figures involving themselves and causing an activity, in this case science, to become political in nature. Undesirable. Since it doesn't say completely or partially undesirable in the topic headline, we, we suggest you look at desirability as on a spectrum and if it's more desirable generally or more undesirable. As for the actual definition, it means harmful or objectionable or unpleasant. Now, as for how this debate should be judged, I could tell you that, that there's a certain set of criteria that you're supposed to judge the debate by to strengthen, to uh, an attempt to play the strength of my argument. But this is a value debate. Unlike a policy or fact debate, this debate is supposed to be subjective. In a fact or policy debate, you can use facts or logic or whatever you deem to be an objective measure to value the debate. But in a value debate, each one of you will listen to our evidence, evaluate our analysis, as well as the evidence and analysis of our opponents, and then come to a decision that is related to your own moral values. Essentially, which way you vote boils down to what you care about most. My first contention is that the potential good of politicizing science is significantly outweighed by the bad. As Albert Einstein once said, if you want to know the future, look at the past. Near the end of the 19th century, a movement started in, in the United States. People wanted to rid society of the unwanted, the feeble-minded, the undesirable. This movement was called eugenics. Initially, eugenics was, was a scientific exploration of getting rid of undesirable traits. Bad enough already. What it became was something far worse. Once the evidence of eugenics was politicized and politicians were able to convince the public that rid society of certain groups of people, such as the disabled, Jews, blacks, immigrants, and anyone else white politicians deemed undesirable. Um, Andrea Entrada of UC Santa Barbara wrote, 
Now, 60,000 sterilizations, many of which were done without consent, took place in 32 states in, in, in which it was legal. There was one man that was particularly inspired by the eugenics movement in the United States. In an article of the LA Times, a quote says, there is today one state in which at least weak beginnings toward a better conception are noticeable. Of course, it is not our model German Republic, but the United States. This man, inspired by the eugenics movement in the United States, as you may have already known, was Hitler. In German Eugenics Between Science and Politics by Peter Weingart, Weingart said, the history of eugenics is one of a reciprocal involvement between science and politics. A little background on Weingart is he has had fellowships at Harvard, Princeton, other prestigious universities in Europe that I cannot pronounce, and uh, received his doctorate from Free University of Berlin. Weingart wants to say that politicians use eugenics' scientific framework to advance their particular causes. The opposition will argue that politicizing science leads to awareness, which leads to funding, which could potentially help people. However, this is true. However, as I've shown, there's also a significant downside of politicians getting involved. I don't know if the good outweighs the bad. Now, I'm not saying the Holocaust wouldn't have happened if politicians didn't involve themselves in eugenics. But for me, my partner Sydney, who are both half Jewish and has family that died in the Holocaust, we can't endorse something that played a role in the murder of our family. Perhaps, objectively, the potential good does outweigh the bad. However, even if this were a fact of policy debate where you are supposed to be objective, I personally just can't get there. In a value debate, which is based on moral values, I definitely can't. Can you? My second contention is that if one political side gets involved, the other side inevitably will as well, splitting the country and decreasing our ability to combat the problem together. In class, we watched The Inconvenient Truth. It seemed to me that Al Gore um, was very passionate about his message and truly wanted to solve the problem. Yet, even he couldn't help but take a few jabs at Republicans in his presentation. Even so, let's assume for the sake of this argument that there are other politicians who are completely dedicated to solving the problem and put their political agendas and egos aside. It seems that people like this would aid the fight against climate change. Unfortunately, this isn't so. If a politician on one side gets involved, the other side will as well. This is what has happened in America. If Democratic politicians, even those that were not in it for political gains, had not politicized climate change, then I think it's likely that Republicans wouldn't as well. Uh, wouldn't be fighting against it. Would it have taken longer for the scientific community to gain traction and inform the people? Yes. Would it take longer for people to react and that problem? Yes. But if it was not politicized, even though it would be a longer route, we, both Democrats and Republicans, would be working together to solve the problem. To, instead, we have our own administration, particularly President Donald Trump, mocking climate change in numerous tweets that I'm sure you've all read. Now, to many of you, President Trump's tweets probably seem childish and wouldn't influence your views, but nearly 62 million people voted for President Trump, and those people, at least some of them, may be greatly swayed by his words and actions. In an article written on March 28, 2018, Jeremy Burke, a reporter with a degree in Earth and Oceanographic Science, wrote that in 2017, 53% of Republicans agreed that most scientists believe climate change is occurring. That number declined to 42% in 2018. In 2018, as the Trump administration has scrubbed mentions of climate change from federal websites, instructed bureaucrats from different agencies to refrain from using the term and backed out of the Paris Agreement. So essentially, Trump didn't involve and back um, Trump didn't involve in, in climate change has led has led to an 11% decrease in Republicans believing climate change is occurring in just one year. To put this 11% into context, there are 325 million Amer Americans in America, and 120 million of which are Republicans. So that 11% decrease due to Trump involving himself in climate change represents 13 million people changing their minds on the topic of climate change. Not only has politicizing climate change split the country, but as I've shown, our current administration is leading the American public to taking huge steps backwards, significantly increasing the difficulty coming together to save our planet. On balances, I won't tell you which way to vote. It's up to you to apply what you've heard to your own individual moral belief system and vote for whichever side you feel is right. Sydney will uh, go over more points, and uh, now I now stand open to questions and points of clarification. Thank you. What was the time on that speech? I don't know. I think it's about six thirty. Six thirty. Do we have oh, someone that can please time and <laughs> yell out the time left orally, please? I'll preserve it. I need a moment, please, Pratik, to write a comment about this first speech.
When do you want the time for us? One. one oh, for this one, just one minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The both speech, speech like three, four, uh, three and six. Three and six. That'd be nice. so you're no longer in the picture, please. Thank you, Brittany. A little more, a little more, a little more, a little more. Very nice. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Nagy. The chair will, is it Nagy? Nagy. Nagy. Yes. Don't call me Nagy. Okay. The chair will now hear from the leader of the opposition for his cross-examination, not to exceed two minutes in length. Begin. Sure. So the first question is, you said that you know, one, if one side gets involved, the other one will inevitably get involved. But don't you think that science and politics are rather, are rather they aren't two diverse things? So even if, they, even if one side doesn't bring it up, don't you think some side will, will eventually bring it up? My point is that if neither side brings it up, then the science behind it can strengthen to the point where there is no uh, politicized debate about it so that a politician can't like argue one way or the other because the facts is, are so secure behind Look it. Look at me, Brent. Oh, sorry. Sure, so regardless of that, uh, the way po policy plays out is scientists have to refer it to some agency in order for the policy to play out. So don't you think that that inevitably will reach the politicians where, wherein it might be debated within the Senate or the Congress? I don't know. They have to do what? So oh, the scientists have to recommend their findings to politicians to enact some sort of policy change. So don't you think it will inevitably be policy? Uh, yeah, the scientists um, suggest, making suggestions based on their credibility and based on their scientific facts is the, the topic is still scientific in nature, okay? So if politicians lobby, then it's political in nature. So therefore, politicization of science is when politi 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 politicians do it, but when scientists do it, it's not. Right, um, so second question, you're quote on Donald Trump, so what do you think the solution to holding him accountable really is at this point? Solution to accounting, uh, what? Uh, uh, holding uh, Donald Trump accountable right now. I don't know how that. So, don't you think that uh, if the Democrats or say some other party uh, advocates for climate change or for any sort of scientific policy, don't you think that that's more desirable at that point? My argument is that it shouldn't get to that point in the first place. Right, but the cycle has already reached to the point where it's already come to this point. So, don't you think the only counteracting effect is politicizing the other side? So, you agree that it would be better if it hadn't been politicized in the first place? Fine. Thank you very much. Critique's cross X is now completed. And now we will hear from the leader of the opposition, who also happens to be Pratik, who will tell us his arguments, which are not to exceed seven minutes in length. today's speech brief first going over some definition clarifications in terms of really contextualizing the debate 
and really explaining what uh, the burdens on each side are. And then after that, I'll be moving on to my three main points of contention. Uh, first main point of contention is that it motivates various stakeholders to participate within the debate. Second uh, contention is that it, uh, politicizing science can help make scientific policy more comprehensive. And the third uh, contention being politicizing motivates science to reestablish itself whenever there is doubt within society. So first, moving on to my first uh, point about like, really cl uh, clarifying the definitions and the overall modeling for this debate. So politicization, as Brett right, rightly pointed out, it does involve when the actors emphasize the inherent uncertainty of science to cast doubt on the existence of scientific consensus. However, the, the definition really goes beyond that, as there are rather four key characteristics for this definition that really need to be taken into account. The first one being is politicization is about emphasizing the inherent uncertainty of science. It's not a competitive framing of a particular debate as it is within a policy one. It's about really putting forth different evidences and then allowing the voters to choose which one do they really believe in. Second thing, politi politicization does not necessarily need to come from a political actor because the source of the politicization could be from an interest group, a fellow citizen, or any other actor for that matter. In this case, it can be scientists as well. Third thing, it is that it's not misinformation of science per se, because it rather involves uh, 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 ac accentuating the, uh, the uncertainty of science rather than spreading false information or any sort of, say, fake news. Because we on side opposition don't believe that fake news necessarily constitutes to what science is. And fourth thing, that under status quo, this is a bipartisan issue, which means that both parties on the either side of the aisle are rather discussing that. So when you say that something is rather undesirable, which it says that you would rather You'd rather see a world where the society is better off, really, rather discussing these political issues on the, you know, on the political spectrum, which goes to show that scientists behind some sort of closed doors are able to make that policy decisions, and at the end of the day, just present those policy decisions to the people, say, uh, either on a voting basis, uh, for that matter, instance. And thirdly, in, when we say science, we are de definitely on side opposition, not in any way defending eugenics, right? Apart from the fact that I'm a South Asian person, I don't think that's rather good thing for me to defend in the first place, but secondly, within the overall context of the debate, we think that the topics of science that need to be defended, or rather politicized, are things such as global warming, if it need be, second thing is like GMOs, third thing, nanotechnology, and the fourth thing being nuclear science for those matters, where we think that these sort of scientific issues are more pertinent in today's world. So what, the, given the criteria, we say that, you know, rather it would be judged based on what the net benefits and costs of, the, of this debate are, because to the point where side opposition is able to prove that there are uh, some potential benefits to that, uh, and for, the, for science to be politicized, at that point we say that that is necessarily desirable, and for that, for those reasons, you should definitely vote for side uh, opposition. But Four before I move left. on... Uh, uh, before I move on to my uh, you know, points of contention, what are the stakeholders that are really involved within this debate? Because each stakeholder has different value metrics that they really adhere to. So the first stakeholder is the scientific community in itself. Because the scientists and the researchers who are invested in this issue have the motivations of ensuring that their science is at the end of the day properly justified and regulated and monitored by people who are involved in this. The second thing are the policy makers. Because these are the ones who inherently decide what the policy should be, and are, as a result need to be taken into account. And the only way they can do such things is by referring back to the scientists who in, in, inherently believe in their you know, agenda and at the same time who they can confer with. And the third thing is the public, because they are the ones who are ultimately impacted by the policy decisions. So the problem on the status quo which they fail to identify is that we have a society and a political leadership that is simply rather isn't concerned about determining the facts accurately. Because the large segments of society particularly corporate and religious sectors, reach their opinions first and then assert the facts, true or not, later. That is the inherent problem. But we see that that's not necessarily, uh, you know, uh, the, but however, the good news on that side is that the, uh, despite the profusion of the heated rhetoric, uh, rhetoric the opinion polls consist consistently show that the public overalls continue to hold science in high regards. In the, NS, uh, in the NSF's science and engineering indicators, which were published in 2012, and mind you, they're published every five years, the public placed strong confidence in leaders of the scientific community, with only the military and medicine garnering higher rankings. So this goes to show that the public is still invested in science and still believes in what the scientific community wants to tell them, and as a, res and a result, are open to considering both facts on either side of the aisle. So the first contention being, it motivates the various stakeholders to participate in the debate and hence widen the scope. Why do we say that? When an issue is politicized, it means that more people are involved in the discussion of the issue or the subject at hand. These additional people not only involve scientists, but also the politicians or groups that are affected by these scientific findings. For instance, firms, advocacy groups, or even universities are rather motivated to get in the debate and participate within the conversation. 
So what is the problem under status quo and why does it need to be politicized? The problem facing the implementation of any kind of sensible climate change policy, for example, is that many powerful organizations believe they would be harmed by it. Therefore, they use the levers of power to but then oppose it. For instance, ExxonMobil has actually invested about $700 billion in fossil fuels uh, subsidies and has impacted research in many ways. But according to an article on the Washington Post by Professor Megan Mullen, uh, wrote that in response, in response to Marshall Science, in recent decades, science advocacy has, found, has focused on promoting the application of science in policy making. Because scientific organizations, professional organizations, and universities have, de have developed fellowship program in response to the politicization of science in order to further their research, because they rather believe in evidence-based policy. So we see that as a result, uh, given that most stakeholders who are affected by this group are rather motivated to participate if it, if it is brought within the political spectrum. Because not only are politicians, Washington. but at the same time, universities are also motivated. Second thing, politicizing science helps make scientific policy more comprehensive. At that point, when it's a bipartisan issue, it helps selecting certain groups to pursue their agenda. What is their evidence for this? During a research forum that took place in George Washington University, for, uh, Dr. McFarlane, who is a policy director for Center for International Science, stated that science policy doesn't exist within a vacuum. At that point, many people need to get involved within this, and that is not only the media, but at the same time, the public who is ultimately affected by this. Therefore, on the evidence on complex scientific subjects, there are many ways of interpreting and finding this data. So as a result, why should we publicize this? According to an article by Ken Baldwin, who is a director of Energy of Climate Change Institute in Australia, it goes to show that we require this sort of political process, uh, updating this sort of our political and governance process. Because the political system cannot be disenfranchised within the overall public. Therefore, the impact that we see is that if more scientists are engaging, we get a better political debate and overall better political Fine. policies. And for all those reasons, proud to oppose. And I'm happy to stand for uh, points of reputation or cross examination. Thank you very much, Pratik. I mean, uh, leader of all opposition, and now we will hear a cross-examination from the leader of the government, not to exceed two minutes in the length. Um, Brittany, uh. Stakeholders, stakeholders involved, the better. So even if some of the stakeholders, particularly the politicians, have no scientific background and their own political agendas are more important than using science in a positive way, is it still better for them to be involved? At that point, uh, it's easy for those sort of politicians to be called out on their knowledge because we have other politicians who have that sort of scientific backing, who have that sort of understanding. So even if they are involved, we say that they'll necessarily be taken care of. So the politicians that rise to the highest powers of power, do they have life scientific background, typically? So, uh, in so far as the current uh, the current president goes, we don't believe that you know he necessarily has a complete understanding, given the fact of his uh, you know overall uh, adherence to appointing things. But the previous presidents have had a huge, rather in depth understanding of what the the scientific policies are and what the scientific understanding is. Okay, Having said that, you. Donald Trump does you have some sort firms, of backing. Yeah. Okay. You claim that firms involving themselves in science is a problem, that and that the politicization of science counteracts that problem. However, is is it that adding more controversy to a problem and adding all the political agendas that are attached to the hip-hop politicians helps counteract that? One minute. Hi, can you repeat that question? How do politicians having their own agendas involving themselves with the firms, that just adds more controversy. How does that help? So insofar as uh, going for that, firms are engaged in their own research that helps bring out new evidence that might counteract the evidence that's been brought out by the other side. At that point, we believe that the democracy in it itself takes care of itself because these firms are, at the end of the day, counteracted by the facts that are already present, and as a result, it helps make the debate much more fruitful. You've said that, and quote, politicization of science is a part, bipartisan issue because either party will take advantage of selecting certain information to pursue their political agenda. So if a politi politician on one side, Democrats, 
makes a certain policy, then won't the bipartisan part, Republicans, rebel against it and vice versa, and then create a different policy when they did in office? How does that help? So that's not necessarily mutually exclusive within science in itself. We see that happening on policy of things oh, across the board, whether it be trade, et cetera. But at this point, insofar as that there are people who are willing to further that sort of policy, we think that at that point, a new policy measures, or even contracting policy measures can take place because at the end of the day, it's a democracy and it's what the people want. Fine. Thank you very much for that cross-examination. Okay, it's now time for us to hear from the member of the government for her speech, not to exceed seven minutes in length. And by the way, for future reference, I told you not to wear white class because you blend with the background, but we'll forgive you. Mm -hmm. The topic is the politicization of science is undesirable. As my partner Brett has already presented to you, this is a value debate. So we are determined to present our contentions and analysis in a way for you, the audience, to decide what you value more. Politicians clearly have revealed that they have used their power in order to further garner more power. So when combining politicians and science, we will demonstrate to you that politicians too have also abused science in order to gain popularity and position themselves in a way that helps them win elections and gain more money from lobbyists. I ask you, the audience, to look at the current political administration and administrations before and wonder if you feel that the politicians' use of science has always been in support of finding the truth. The opposition must be able to demonstrate that politicizing science is desirable and politicians with no scientific background should be able to discuss scientific data, formulate policies, and control the extent to what scientific evidence the public hears. For too long, the abuse and manipulation of scientific evidence to further political agendas have taken place. Science is no longer as favored by the American populace because it has a place in politics and is debated amongst politicians as if it is an issue that can be ranked with the economy, gun policy, and terrorism. Ira Hyman from Psychology Today emphasizes that science is not political, and doing science isn't about being a Democrat or a Republican. I will go over my three arguments. Argument one, politicians are not focused on solving problems and are more concentrated on receiving votes. Science is no longer valued or favored because it becomes political and ranked among other political issues. According to a 2016 election survey completed by Pew Research Center, the environment, which we can view as an aspect of science, is ranked number 12 out of 14 issues by Ameri Americans that find the most important. Elizabeth Suhey, a professor at American University, wrote in the Oxford Research Encyclopedia that sometimes officials act in the pursuit of personally held values. More, more often, their actions are driven by the preferences of colleagues, interest groups, and constituents. In other words, Government policy is a route through which a variety of actors directly and indirectly influence scientific knowledge. Clearly, political influences on scientific knowledge can impede the progress of science if politicians are only focused on receiving votes. So, if Americans value science less than other political issues, then politicians are not going to take their time focusing on science or solving problems related to science. Argument number two. Politicians getting involved gets big money involved, which then becomes agenda-oriented. The political atmosphere of the U.S. has absorbed astonishing amounts of money, and over the years, the amount of money put into elections has significantly risen. As constituents and Americans, we wonder exactly where this money comes from. It makes me think back to the Watergate scandal. Follow the money? The Koch brothers, conservative billionaires worth more than $52 billion, have made their fortune in various industries, specifically oil and chemical compounds. The Koch brothers spent $400 million on the 2012 election, $889 million on the 2016 election. 
This isn't to say, based on Nicholas Confessore, investigative report at the New York Times, that this is just their money. But they get with donors and they go over at summits twice a year how they're going to invest money into politicians to make sure their environmental regulations are limited. As he goes on to further say, Unlike the parties, the Koch's network is constructed chiefly of nonprofit groups that are not required to reveal donors. That makes it almost impossible to tell how much of the money is provided by the Koch's, among the wealthiest men in the country, and how much by other donors. Philip Elliott, a journalist for the Time Magazine, revealed that the Koch brothers plan to spend $400 million this midterm election. Families like the Koch brothers invest millions of dollars in political elections to make sure politicians support their business ventures and prevent regulations from hurting their profits. Any type of scientific evidence that potentially reveals that regulations should be made pertaining to chemical and oil companies pose huge threats to the people who own these companies. So families like the Koch brothers involved in fields pertaining to oil and that hurt the environment pay as much money as they can to push their own agendas in politics. Argument number three. Many politicians have cut funding to science and do not support scientific research. The huge cut to scientific funding affects the progress of this country and hurts the advancement of science. If science is not valued and funded sufficiently, scientists in academia will be faced with a tough position to take out some of the, the research they plan to do or not use as advanced tools because the expense is not within their budget. In the late 1960s, before leaving office, Jimmy Carter placed 32 solar panels on the White House. Once Ronald Reagan took office, they were taken down. <laughs> Revealed by David Biello, an award-winning journalist who has been reporting on the environment and energy since 1999. Emily DeMarco, who got her degree in environmental science from UCSB and writes for sciencenews.org, outlined how many scientific government programs would be cut this next year in President Trump's proposed budget. The National Science Foundation, 11%. U.S. Geological Survey's budget, 15%. National Institute of Standards and Technology, 23%. National Oceanic and Atmosphere Administration, 32%. The EPA's Office of Science and Technology, 37%. The budget proposes a 16% cut for the Department of Energy's Office of Science, the largest supporter of basic research in the physical sciences. Richard Myers, an AMED professor of neurology and the author of more than 250 papers, says One his minute. funding came to a screeching halt in 2008. Jonkins goes on to further quote him, I don't know what good science is, and that compromises the science. Political administrations do not value scientific evidence, as seen in 2003, when a climate change report written by the EPA was changed. The removal of any reference to review confirming that human activity contributed global warming was ordered by the White House. So overall, as I have illustrated to you all, Scientific evidence has been manipulated, has been cut, and will continue to be cut until we finally say something has to be done. Us, as our generation, must prove that politicizing science is not helpful to our country or helpful to any of the future generations after us. Thank you. I now stand open for... Oh, I now stand open for cross-examination and questions for clarification. Please come to the front of the podium to be cross-examined by your opponent, Brittany. Say in the power stance, it's feet wider than your shoulders. Yeah, thank you. It's power stance, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Policymakers ask scientists when taking policy measures. So, how can you say that their policy makes them uneducated? I would argue that policies involving scientists, in terms of like scientists making policies, if government officials are pushed by interest groups, those policies are going to be hampered because if they see that scientific evidence from scientists showing that those policies don't work, they don't want to say that to the scientists, nor do they want to reveal that to the American public because those interest groups have given them so much money. Okay. Re regarding argument three, don't you think that pressuring policy will help, set, um, help increase the funding because scientists need stakeholders and I'm sorry, no, wait, oh, that's okay, I'll do it next, sorry. Um, 
you say science is impeded, but for the past 20 years, science has gone forward despite politicizing. One minute. I would argue that's not the case, considering since the space race, the funding for scientific programs has been cut, as I have already illustrated in the next proposed budget. Every year since it's become more politicized and more money has gone to politics, scientific funding has been cut, and other issues like gun policy, terrorism, and military have gone up. So to me, it doesn't seem like scientific funding is going to continue going up anytime soon, or has it gone up over the last 20 years since it's been cut over the last three, four political administrations? Okay. Thank you very much. The chair will now hear from the member of the opposition for her opposition speech not to exceed seven minutes in length. Hi, I'm Brittany, and I'm, Hi, Brittany. And I'm for the politicizing of science and designing for science. Research on intention and source credibility shows how people respond to presentations of scientific information. To be more specific, the only way for an audience to learn about a body of scientific work and evidence is to first capture their attention long enough to comprehend the information and to second, gain their trust as a credible source to listen to. However, it is not the easiest task for scientists to achieve. As studies have proven that academic pedigree, such as being a scientist or even having a PhD, is not enough for listeners to classify as a credible source of information. Research performed on source credibility found that emphasizing common interests and relative expertise can help science communicators more effectively convey their findings in politicized environments. As it narrowed down factors based on the premise that an audience would choose to listen and believe information from people who resembled their perception of what a credible source would be, and that meant those who shared similar interests, such as wanting a common goal, who had a relative expertise on the topic, and also the reason to believe that the speaker would not mislead, led to results finding that it didn't matter who was presenting the information, it would still be believable. What I mean is how when you would say that politicizing science is an exaggeration or misinformation, it's really not. It's really just taking the information at hand and gaining the audience's attention for them to believe the issue that's presented. Mm -hmm. And these findings are beneficial because it enables science communicators to establish source credibility by taking the time to relate their own interest in a scientific problem to that of their audience such as, for an example, through television shows or political entrepreneurs, which are used to simply reinterpret scientists' findings. To quote, focal themes in this research show the value of understanding and related scientific findings to a target audience resisting concerns and beliefs. With such knowledge in hand, there is expanded potential for producing communicative outcomes that are more likely to help more audiences reconcile their beliefs and decision with scientific knowledge. So if there is, so if the scientific community can't communicate to audiences what they need to communicate as in their body of work, and seemingly that the public isn't educated on issues like sometimes climate change, like before this class I didn't know myself. And so I feel that if you are using maybe an actor to present an issue, if they're not paying attention, then that would be worthwhile. To conclude, the politicization of science is a beneficial tool yeah. used to make scientific policy more comprehensive to audiences. And a study performed by the National Academy of Science of the United States of America tackled the issue of effective communication between scientists and audiences as the issues of science not being able to spread the knowledge in terms of the general public. Moving on to my second argument, politicizing motivates science to reestablish itself whenever there is questioning. In a thriving democracy, society forms politics. Politics control science, and science informs both society and politics. This isn't new information, we all know it, yet some of us refuse to acknowledge the intimate interplay between society, politics, and science. 
when scientists or even scientific organizations hand together to tackle issues that are harming society, we can see that there is positive change that can take place as science is never inherently divorced from society or the issues that face the society. Additionally, the reality is that engaging in scientific research is a social activity and an inherently political one. Funding science is not a default position when creating a country. It's a decision we made once as a society and continue to revisit as we make new policies and pass budgets. To, to further show evidence, an article in the Scientific American by, uh, I can't pronounce, Ubra Sabli, a PhD student in medicine, noted that science has helped address societal issues. For instance, in the 1930s, scientists formed the Association of for American scientific workers with the goal of inviting scientists to take a moral stance and involve them directly in political instrumental in improving the quality of science reporting. In 1946, Albert Einstein also weighed in on racism in America in his eloquent essay, The Negro Question, which he characterized as a disease of white people. Not only that, but he also co-chaired in an anti-lynching campaign. Even later, during the Cold War, scientists didn't all shy away from political engagement. The American Association for the Advancement of Science expressed, expressly opposed the war in Vietnam, and Carl Sagan was a prominent voice on the dangers of nuclear proliferation during the Reagan era. Therefore, given how science and politics are inseparable, we can see that politicization of science and advocacy on behalf of science scientists has helped society tackle some key issues that we're facing it back in the day. Without the support from scientists yeah. and the counteracting effects that it has had, we would not have been able to suppress or even challenge the claims that were being made. Therefore, politicizing is desirable as it has a positive benefit to the society. And for my last argument. One minute. Politicizing helps question scientific evidence and bring forth a difference in opinion. When looking at a body of work from scientists like evidence on climate change, there are inherently going to be differing opinions on whether there should be a policy made based on the values in which a scientist and a policy maker hold. It doesn't matter that even though the scientists and maybe even the policy makers agree that there is enough evidence to deem an acceptable issue, the values that the values that decipher whether the issue is important enough to be heard or not, as there cannot be a cost benefit analysis without bias or values. And to conclude, my vote for the opposition. We have proven on the point that more stakeholders are motivated to participate in the debate. These are not only scientists but also Fine. universities, advocates, advocacy groups. This increased participation within democracy is important as it not only creates a free market of ideas, but also ensures that the political, powerful organizations that have unamassed wealth are not left brain in on policy. I now stand open for cross-examination and points of clarification. Why did Americans prior to the 2016 election rank the environment and science as 12 out of 14 issues most important to them? Can you repeat that? You claim in your brief that the public overall continues to hold science in high regard. However, why did Americans prior to the 2016 election rank the environment as 12 out of 14 issues most important to them? With your first argument, you said that politicizing helps question scientific evidence and bring forth differences in opinion. In terms of differences in opinion, do you recall that Giordano Bruno was burned at the stake in 1600 for putting forth an opinion that there was a sun-centered universe? Though civilization no longer burns people at the stake, who is there to say that scientists will be harmed for putting forth evidence that goes against the opinions of politicians? I... <laughs> I that scientists, One minute. the evidence that's given, I'll go to the next one. 
You claim that differing views are able to shape a discussion on scientific related issues. However, do you agree that we are currently in intense political gridlock? So, if politicians cannot even debate in general on all issues, what makes it possible that they can debate on science effectively? Do you recall there was a government shutdown? No. You say that scientific debates are in fact political debates because resolving scientific debates will resolve political conflicts. Do you have examples of this? I don't. You bring up historical examples of science helping address societal issues, but can science help address societal issues without having to be involved in politics? No, I said that science and politics are inherently involved with religion. Okay. You claim scientists and universities. Thank you very much. It's now time for our refutation, which involves the four parts, as we all know. She said, I disagree because, and therefore, so. Brett, let's see if you can follow those four parts in two minutes. So let's first hear from the leader of the government in his refutation. Begin. They say the more stakeholders, including politicians, involved in a scientific to topic, the better. We disagree because politicians that rise to positions of power unlikely have a scientific background. Example, President Trump. Uh, therefore, we believe politicians should stay in their own lane. Uh, they say that firms involving themselves in science is bad and that politicians involving themselves can help counteract that. We disagree because adding more people with negative agendas doesn't help anything. Therefore, we believe that politicians should stay, should uh, not be involved. Essentially, if an issue is on fire, pol politicians getting involved is like throwing gas on it. Pol um, particularly because the firms that he says that politicians were supposed to counteract probably donate to those politicians and therefore beholden to them. They say politicians involving themselves helps policymakers make more well-informed decisions. We disagree because the opposition even says that the politicization of science is bipartisan and that politicians use science to further their own agendas. Our disagreement is in their brief. Okay, therefore, we believe that the agendas politicians are beholden to will split the country and make it nearly impossible for us to combat the problems that arise. In this context of this class, climate change, um, the very real problem that we are currently involved in, if it was never politicized, then possibly we could have, like, the science behind it could have been, if, it, if neither Republicans nor Democrats were fighting against it because it was not been politicized, then we could work together, the scientific community could build up enough strength that by the time it got to possibly being politicized, it was impossible or neither side would have a legitimate chance of fighting against it. And therefore, uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. The chair will now hear the leader of the opposition for his refutation not to exceed two minutes in length, but should include the four steps of refutation. points they say that because science has its funding cut under status quo is because we, it's, it's that's the reason why we shouldn't politicize science but we disagree on our side of the house because that's really the reason why we should be politicizing it right now because if we don't then in no way is it going is science suddenly going to get back its funding because politicians suddenly have had a change of heart saying that now we need to like you know increase the funding for science because science research and scientific evidence overall is certainly more important for us. The only way that we can counteract in any uh, in uh, any decrease in funding is by ensuring that not only politicians but other actors which I've already highlighted such as scientists or the general public also get involved within that debate and also uh, help uh, their congressmen uh, or for that matter their senators uh, lobby within uh, the government to increase the funding for science. That is how we get some sort of increasing funding, not by just saying that because something's undesirable at that point that some of funding is going to cut back. Uh, second point uh, they really bring out is that if science was not 
Uh, they say that if science was not politicized, then you know scientists could have somehow collaborated with each mm -hmm. other, and as a result, you know, created the po positive policy benefits that they want. However, we completely disagree with that because even if scientists would have worked together, we have to recognize that scientists have different data sets and different evidences that they can come up with. So even within the scientific community, there would have been counteracting evidences that would have disproven each other at the end of the day, right? But when we have that sort of policy outcome, it needs to be brought out to the politicians. Having that sort of debate on that spectrum not only increases the number of people who are involved in this, but at the same time, those debates really happen at the spectrum where it needs to be happened in terms of policy outcomes. So at that point, when we say that politicization helps, it really helps create a much more comprehensive policy because not only are scientists involved, but at the same time they take into account other factors that would help policy uh, be more comprehensive. Therefore, we think that politicization on both those factors, in so far that it will help increase funding, in so far that it will help uh, people really understand the agendas, and at the same time politicians are more educated on the status quo given that they help uh, uh, cover scientists, we think that for all those reasons, politicization of science is necessarily desirable. Fine. Thank you very much. The chair will now hear the member of the government for her refutation, which is not to exceed two minutes in length and should include four parts. So, um, in following up with my third argument, I did want to mention one important quote that I found really important. Adam Frank, a U.S. physicist, astronomer, and writer for NPR, said, in other words, the problem is not science, it's science and policy, or better yet, it's science and politics. The critical and endlessly exasperating case of climate change is the example of the problem. The basic scientific case that the planet's climate is changing due to human activity has been unsettled for at least 25 years, and policymakers have known about the dangers of climate change since the 1960s. But as we are painfully aware not only has nothing been done, but opposition is so prevalent that we can't even get to debating the real issue. They say that politicizing science is necessary and to a certain extent required when discussing scientific issues and bettering society. We disagree because the current, current political gridlock within Congress and the removal of five scientists from the EPA by Scott Pruitt further weakens the value and recognition of science and politics. One minute. Therefore, separating science and factual beliefs from politics will further validate the science that cannot be manipulated to further business interests and won't need to rely on funding from politicians to survive. They say we should further politicize science to get more funding. We disagree because at least 46 science 46% of scientists in a report compiled by the Union of Sciences said political interests hampered their ability to carry out their goals. Therefore, science should have no place in politics. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And last but not least, we will hear from the member of the opposition, which will be her final two-minute refutation, which she'll include four parts refutation. Begin, please. They say science and policy needs to be divorced. We disagree because the two are interconnected, because they're interdependent. You can use funding that way. Political interest will always be there no matter what you do. We have proven on the point that more stakeholders are motivated to participate in the debate. Additionally, we have shown how the policy is made more comprehensive when scientists are constantly involved in the political spectrum. They can influence policy that would help policymakers work in the right decision. And lastly, it helps science reestablish itself within a society that ultimately controls it. Given that society, politics, and science are interconnected, politicization Thank you very much. It's now time to cross the house and congratulate your worthwhile opponent on a wonderful debate. And now we will have the judges please do your job. Yes, please do your job. Uh -huh. And uh, mm, can you do your job and collect them all? I
The film's roll here on Tuesday. Give me a couple of units of credit for all the time I spent on. Um, it's kind of gone, and so make sure it doesn't stop. Don't worry. You're doing a weird thing. It stops in an hour, so keep your eye on it. I'll, I'll keep an eye on it. No problem. Thank you. Yeah, I know that I can get there consistently. <laughs> Do I, are there more ballots to come in? Okay. Get them in, Okay, ladies and gentlemen, on a fourteen to four decision, the winners are the government or the proposition. Hard to 
change people's values. You can appeal to people's values, which is what I think the debaters were trying to do. But uh, we had a different approach to deciding the value debate, which I just wanted to point out to all of you. Secondly, it's a little late because we're coming down to the final debate, but I want to remind people in this uh, a bill in this era of fake news and your he did say I want you to compare the evidence and it would have been helpful and I say a pox on both houses uh, of not reading fully the citation and date so you as an audience member can completely compare the evidence between sides some people did a good job of giving you sources and where they were from and their qualifications. Others did not. And I want to remind everybody, if you don't know what the Chicago style of footnoting looks like, I hate to be pedantic, but it looks like this. A little footnote at the bottom of each page, a full citation at the bottom of each page, and a bibliography. A footnote at the bottom of each page and a bibliography. Okay? So that was an important thing I wanted to remind everybody. Of. Uh, one thing I wanted to say to uh, the government team, the opening government team, was the, he cited the Dan Kahane evidence in your brief, but did not use it in your oral presentation. I know you were running out of time. Uh, in my opinion, I thought the guy from Yale's credentials and studies were stronger than what you used. But you disagree, or uh, what, what was that? What was your thinking there? I had like a story that I was trying to get out. And yeah. when I timed it in my house, it was like 7.20 with Kahan in it. Yeah. And so I took that out because yeah. all, it took, takes time to explain like, like the, um, the title, the, the person, stuff like that. It doesn't and the groups yeah. and all that. Okay. So I just didn't, it wasn't necessary for me to get my point across. Okay. Fair enough. Critique. Uh, critique presented a good counter criteria for the politician science from the Journal of Communication, which we didn't fully cite, which would have given it more credibility. Critique had some awfully good pieces of evidence and analysis, which you also didn't fully cite and give the date of his rather excellent evidence. Let's start in the front today with Elsie. Hi, I'm Elsie. Uh, I Hi, Elsie. Hi. You lose the hat? <laughs> what? I hate hats. So I voted for government side because uh, they provided stronger evidence and used many statistics, statistics to support their uh, argument. And the opposition side did not provide enough evidence during the cross-examination cross part. And also I like uh, Sydney's arguments that she mentioned that uh, the politicians involved where money involved, and the politicians just follow the money. They do not care about the money. Yeah. So that was the my phone was on. I don't know if you turned your phone off. So that was the, the the big argument for you was follow the money and the Koch brothers argument and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Politician mm -hmm. argument. And so on. Okay. okay. Thank you, Elsie. Uh huh. Uh, 
had like originally like what my where my values stand. So I was facing this debate, trying to see if like anything on this side could convince me to switch my opinions. And I thought they did have really good evidence. I was pretty convinced to switch my values. Um, but during the cross examination, I felt that the affirmative was getting really good questions and the opposition wasn't able to like answer fully. So it kind of brought me back to the perspective of the affirmative. Right. And I also thought a good thing for both teams, I felt like your contentions were very like simple and easy to follow. Um, you had said a lot after, but you made sure to like roadmap what those like certain contentions would be and I thought that was very clear from all of you. Great. Um, I thought, by the way, Kiara, and maybe you didn't want to put a word or, or a name to it, but I thought that if you were using a standard of good reason or performance or that sort of thing as a standard of who did a better job of debating, who did a better job of doing the cross act and doing the reputation, then some people could clearly base that decision and go affirmative on that. So that was, you know, that, that would have been a perfectly legitimate standard to use in your your decision making. Yes, please. It sounds like a little bit of what you did, Kiara, when you said that Cindy's reputation and the process were very effective. Yes. Hi, my name is Malik. I Hi, voted, Malik. I voted for the affirmative. Yes, um, I thought they had a great performance. Uh, but the other reason why is because um, so Brett came in, said his argument, then critique kind of like tore it down, and then Sydney was able to like build it back up. But um, I think uh, uh, you didn't do that much of a great job to build that argument back up, so it kind of fell uh, for me, and so that's why I ended up voting for the affirmative. I think they also asked really good questions at the cross sex, and they answered them, um, which showed that they were they were very knowledgeable about their briefs and this topic. Um, the other thing that I had in my brain. Um, oh, and I like Sydney's like Rick, Reagan and Carter thing and all those like, small little analogies that I thought were. The little story, yeah. yeah. He, took, he took the solar panel off. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that um, on the, um, you, you talked about the performance of, of a Brett critique, breaking it down, building back up, breaking it down, building it back up. That's very much what we were looking for in having a good debate, is having that clash and the rebuilding of your arguments and rebuilding and see if it continued all the way through. Sadly, it didn't go all the way through, but you, know, you saw that uh, it was a um, good clash. Very good class. Let's go here to our the nicest woman in the class, Haley. Okay, hi, my name is Haley. Hi, um, Haley. So I voted for the proposition. Sorry, for she. Um, but hey, so I voted based on good reasoning. Um, so basically, I was assessing this based on whichever side convinced me that like environmental concern efforts would like improve um, and like which world is more preferable and I was really sold with Sydney all of your arguments you did a really good job um, and just like your points about how the politi like politicizing it um, can actually impede the efforts by like affecting um, the reports or like what is funded or not funded and I also appreciate the examples and stuff. Right. One issue I wanted to raise, and I, I, I raise it now. You guys just love talking to me. Me too, yeah. One issue I wanted to raise was this issue of that happened in the 30s. And, it, you know, critique was quick to say, look, you know, we're not going to defend that. But I was intrigued that Brett brought in this historical example of politicians sort of gone awry and saying, you know, yeah, right. 
After all, science proves that blacks and Jews are inferior. Let's put them in the oven, et cetera, et cetera. And Pratik says, I'm not defending that, but you know, it was a historical example, but it never got uh, mentioned again in the debate. And I was wondering if any of you thought that was curious or a waste of time that Brad introduced her. What, do you want to comment on that at all, Haley? I yeah. think it was a good point, but you Stand up, please. We're a, we're a communication class. I yeah. thought it was a good point, but maybe I think you spent a little too much time on it, just because I think most people would have gotten the reference without like so much background. But I thought it was like, it was useful. Yeah, it was interesting. Yes, please. Frank? Hi, Frank. Um, there, I agree with you. It was like, mostly, you oh, oh, for affirmative. But uh, when you said this is pretty much on your own values, I sort of realized that like halfway through, I was like, I don't, I was just kind of agreeing with the specific values you guys were saying. So uh, for the opposition, when you guys said, um, when you guys said they're pretty much entangled, like you can't separate them. They're just, they come with each other. I, I completely agree with that. But I think recently when you, when you give examples of like past presidents, when they put up solar panels, take them down, or get rid of certain cabinet members that are obviously better scientists, or have better scientific background, it kind of makes more sense that at, it's more relatable to me in this culture, I guess. My, my value is that I just, I don't think that's, that's very smart. I think I think to get rid of certain pol uh, certain politicians that obviously are better scientists, it's just it seems like it should be they should be separated in some sense nowadays. I guess. Okay. Thank you. Yes, please. Hi, I'm Danielle. Hi, Danielle. Hello. Uh, so I voted affirmative. Um, I think that the evidence is a lot stronger than what cuts, um, EPA scientists afraid of political backlash, and yeah, everyone has said stuff about the solar panels, but I mean, I circled that when I was throwing the debate, because I couldn't think of a rational reason why. Yeah, there really wasn't. Um, yeah, and yeah, your rebuttal was really succinct and concise. So thank you. Yeah, I think uh, I'll just add a little point about storytelling and how little stories can be more memorable than a slew of facts or little stories added at the end of facts. It helps facts be more memorable. And a lot of people have mentioned that that Carter Reagan exchange where you know President Reagan just wanted to put a little knife in the side of Jimmy Carter and his what he considered his silliness. Yes please. Hi, Natalie. So I ultimately voted for the affirmative, um, but in all honesty, I was kind of on the fence, especially in this debate, because I didn't go in with a lot of um, like my own values, because this is not something that I like particularly in global warming thought about a lot. So this idea of climate change and politicization like was something newer to me. So I was really open to both sides. Um, I voted based on good reasons as my model. I felt like as a value debate. Um, the affirmative did a better job addressing the fact that it was a value debate. I think that Pratik's rebuttal was really great and it almost convinced me at the very end, but the way that you mentioned um, how like if we cut funding, the only solution is like allowing a little bit of politics in because it will bring funding to science. I think that was a really good point, but it almost seemed more of a policy point to me. Like it necessarily, it offered a solution, which I don't think that many value de debates can be like a clear solution. Just like in my opinion, that's how I see it. But um, but I thought what you mentioned was really important and really good, and it helped bring you guys back. Um, and I think that as well, um, the way that Sydney included numbers, this is kind of an abstract topic. It can be at least, and that the way you included numbers made it really concrete and like feasible, and you could actually see the things going on. Uh, the examples weren't as like pathological as like Brett's story was in the beginning. So for me, your examples were more clear cut and I could say like, oh, well I can base this, this is a reason for me. Um, and I think that overall, um, both sides including the year for the evidence that you mentioned would be good. I know that like politics and science 
like those two combining, like the year saw is important because we're looking at history, we're looking at like a long range of events, but it's still important to know that the people that you're talking about are people currently in the field because otherwise they seem kind of irrelevant to the situation. So I understand where you're coming from with history, but at the same time mention the year of those people. Um, but overall, I think that it was great because of the clash that was going on. Sorry, Michelle. That's a good point. Um, and, uh, I would also add that um, uh, the uh, this was, by the way, um, this was a, a, a as far as no one has mentioned the spheres argument, but this is a classic example of where two spheres, politics and uh, you know, not religion, except for some people, but uh, you know, uh, <laughs> are. Uh, uh, clashing and uh, you know politics and science and they clearly have different rules and regulations and different goals and things like that and in some ways at, at the core they may be very incompatible go ahead I need to just say something quickly oh, go, ahead. go ahead I just stand up and hold your time I need to say something So uh, I'm Cole, and I thought you guys all did a really good job. Um, I ultimately voted for the affirmative. Sorry, but I thought you did a really good job, guys. Both the opposite as well as did well too. Um, for me personally, this might just be my preference, but I think Brett, you kind of told a lot about uh, the like exaggerations or the not exaggerations. Um, uh, I'm just trying to find the right word for it. Like the extremes. Yeah, thank you. Like the extremes of your scenarios, so I kind of didn't resonate as much with the extremes because I was like, oh, these are kind of like the waypoints of each spectrum. And then when uh, Sydney came in, then she talked about like all these different stats and uh, was able to bring in all these more uh, easy to resonate with evidence. So that's what actually really sold me was uh, your evidence because it, I guess, pertained was easier to um, relate to. And then, but Pratik, I thought you did a really good job. I specifically liked how you had countered Sydney's point. That almost tipped me on the other, the other side. But um, then Sydney was able to come back in her rebuttal. And um, I think ultimately for me as well, looking at like the actual motion being of uh, polarization is, the, is undesirable. Um, yes, I think that's what the affirmative won by, that it was, un you proved to me that it was undesirable. If any, I, you, you proved to me like maybe it's, Necessary that we need, pull it, or uh, we need it, but in my opinion, they have proved that it was undesirable. So that's why I actually went for that. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Yes, please. Hi, I'm Jacob. Hi, Jacob. Um, I voted for the opposition. Um, hey, right. Uh, I thought everyone did a great job, and I thought if we're basing it off like performance, I would have voted affirmative. But I thought there was some wasted time in the affirmative, especially um, you mentioned talking about the historical stuff like uh, the Holocaust and eugenics and such, I thought that didn't really help you out too much. Um, so I kind of put that as a mark against you guys. Uh, also, Sydney brought up a lot of numbers about how Trump's, President Trump's cutting spending. And like, I saw your point, but I also thought because it's politicized, it's still getting the funding, even if it's getting cut, it's still getting the funding. So I kind of threw that point out, um, and I thought Pratik's rebuttal uh, was great. So that's why I voted uh, opposition. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Can you uh, point in? Oh. Brad. Uh, Hi, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> Could you just explain to me, uh, just so my own like personal knowledge, like why didn't it help? Just because, like, from my personal beliefs, like whenever I make any decision in my life, I think of the worst case scenario, the best case scenario. And I like apply my, uh, like do that, apply to that. So can you tell me like exactly why I did it? So my big thing was, <laughs> uh, my big thing was, uh, I came to the debate thinking it was going to be about like climate change, global warming, and such. And I thought that was a very extreme, extreme case. And I thought, like he said, it didn't really resonate with me because that was one specific example in his in history that the worst thing possible because of politicization happened to science. And I thought we weren't gonna, like like you said, the ends of the spectrum. It's, it's so far yeah. away from, from
from what we're considering right now, it would uh, find a change of global warming that that it could never get to the point where millions of lives are lost. And I just, it's interesting. Okay. Thank that's you. That's fair. I mean, although, yeah, that's fair. Although Chris P. mentioned other geomodels and other things that he was prepared to run, run another direction with. I might also thank the government for return, referring to our president as President Trump. I felt it gave them a slap. Yes, please. So I feel like politicians aren't the only form of 
donate their EA funding. And that also the points the politicians like nowadays, they made a lot of good points, especially with the percentages at the end. And I think that politicians, like even with gun control, they can't even do that right now. So how the heck are they doing these signs? Thank you. Yes, please. Okay, my name is Tyler. I so, voted affirmative. If, there had, if this had been a policy debate, I probably would have voted opposition because I just feel like um, they gave a good, perceived made a really good point um, that these two things are inseparable and that, you know, just because funding is being cut doesn't mean that separating them completely will somehow get um, more funding for the affirmative. And I just didn't really get a sense from the affirmative, like, how. Um, how science would function if it was separated from politics. Um, but I did, I, I ended up voting affirmative because of your guys' delivery. I thought you guys had a really strong delivery. Storytelling, um, Brett did a really good job of bringing the delivery of numbers. He said, he, instead of saying like 11% of Americans, he said 13, or something like, ended up turning 11% into like 13 million, basically. Um, so I just feel like your guys' storytelling was, was what's happening. Yeah, I think it's interesting that on a policy level, it wasn't clear what the two worlds looked like, but on a value level and on a performance level, it very clearly was an affirmative debate. Um, so that's, that's the evil eye. Yeah, the evil eye. Okay, so I have to leave it up there. I'll make it short. My name is Yassine. Um, I voted for the affirmative because I think it was a policy debate. Like you said, I would probably vote for the opposition, just because um, the affirmative didn't really, and I guess they really didn't need to since it's a value debate, but they didn't uh, put out a solution that would that would make it. Like I never understood how we could have science without politicizing it. Um, but back to the value debate, I think you guys did a great job, especially the points that Cindy brought up about uh, there being so much conflict of interest. <laughs> um, and so you guys had a quick question. You had a sort you said that it gets published every five years and you cited the 2012 yeah. year, but last year it was 2017. I wasn't able to get that Okay. Yeah, so I feel like the political climate's a lot different now yeah. than in 2012. Like, might have skewed the thing, but I'll sit down loudly. Thank you, everyone.